Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this ETF Live interview. Today, we're going to talk about non-formal education. What is it? What is it for? And most importantly, what are the mechanisms that we can use to validate or, and obtain certificate uh, about the skills and knowledge that we acquire outside formal education system? Um, I would like to introduce you our guest speakers for today. First of all, Anna Carlson from Swedish National Agency for Higher Vocational Education. It's an agency responsible for supporting and promoting validation of prior learning in Sweden in both education and working life. Hello, Anna. Welcome. Thank you, Maria. It's very nice to be here. Nice to have you. Uh, then we have Maria Rosenstock, who is an expert from the European Training Foundation. Um, she works on supporting the development of uh, validation of non-formal and informal learning in EU neighboring countries. Welcome, Maria. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And last but not least, we have Michelle Aribon, who is an expert with many years of experience on, on validation of non-formal learning in many countries, such as Tunisia and Madagascar. Hello, Michelle. Hello. Nice to Welcome. see you. Welcome. And before we get started with our conversation, I would like to ask all our followers to uh, um, actively participate in this conversation. Please send us your questions and your comments. And we would like to know where are you watching us from today? So we really would like to understand the geography of this uh, live interview. So to start our conversation, let's set up terminology. What is non-formal and informal learning? Anna. Well, um, I'd say that in our context, uh, non-formal learning is learning that is, that is organized learning but takes place outside of formal education. So let's say if you, for instance, uh, go uh, participate in a course that your employer wants you to take to learn something new, uh, but it's a short course, uh, maybe by a private provider, etc., that would be considered non-formal uh, learning in Sweden. When we talk about informal learning, um, we talk about it as the learning that is happening more or less every day in our job that is unplanned and perhaps it's not intentional, uh, but it's still happening when you new learn new things in jobs, when you get uh, new work tasks, etc. And the term that we use here in Sweden is, is and in the other Nordic countries, is more, most often referring to prior learning, which then it includes aspects of both non-formal and informal learning, I'd say. So and it's, it's kind of one term to say, say the both things together, right? Yes. And then mm -hmm. we use the term uh, real competence in Swedish. So real competence, this is what's being assessed in a validation procedure, irregardless of where you actually develop that competence. Mm -hmm. um, Maria, why do you think this topic is important at all? And uh, why are we talking about it today? Well, this topic is important because the world is undergoing transition. We, uh, we face uh, big changes on the labor market. Uh, we face digitalization and uh, we face the transition to green economy. And with this regard, uh, I think we cannot expect anymore that we will be uh, um, hired at the same job for the whole life like it used to be. So the jobs are changing, labor market is changing, and there is a big challenge to really keep our skills up to date. So we have to be aware of the fact that we have to keep learning. Um, and for example, at the European uh, Union level, uh, EU has set up very ambitious targets uh, to assure by 2030 that 60% of adults will be participating in some forms of uh, lifelong learning. Uh, that is a very ambitious target, uh, a target that even uh, European countries are, uh, some of them are really um, uh, quite away from. Uh, in uh, the countries that are surrounding Europe, in developing countries, uh, um, the participation in adult learning is, uh, is quite low. So there is still a lot of work to do to encourage people to learn and also to recognize the skills that we already have, but we might not be, uh, that, that might not be certified. 
And thanks a lot, Maria. Of course, it's it's great point that we have to motivate people to develop themselves, but when they get the opportunity to actually develop a skill and then validate it so they can use it in a, let's say, more formal setting of looking for a job, that's a big thing. So now I'd like to pass to the topic of validation of non-formal learning. Um, can maybe Anna or Michelle give us a definition of what is validation of non-formal learning? Well, Michelle, you will have to start. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. In fact, uh, um, to validate informal learning is in reality to validate the results of the, of the non formal and informal learning. So it's a process which enables everyone to have at one moment in his life or in her life to have the, the learning outcomes coming from all uh, learning setting outside of the formal system uh, to have these uh, uh, learning outcomes uh, assessed, validated, and recognized through, uh, for example, a qualification system, a certification uh, process, and so on. So uh, the, 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 the validation of non-formal and informal learning, this is not a fully correct sentence from my point of view. It's a validation and recognition or certification, as you want, of the outcomes of the non-formal and informal learning process. Uh, yeah, so it's not the learning that we validate, but what we've the learned. But the learning what, yeah. process yeah. is the learning process, whatever, mm -hmm. formal, non-formal, informal, and so on. What we do when we develop of uh, uh, validation uh, of prior learning, of informal learning, and so on. It's a specific technical process which enables the assessment and the validation. And it's a way of giving value to the outcomes coming from the mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Michelle. And Anna, anything to add to that? Well, I think the giving value part that Michelle is talking about is extremely important because that's what it's all about. Uh, people learn a lot in in contexts outside of formal learning. And if we don't have mechanisms or systems to actually utilize that learning, uh, it will be both for society and for employers and, and, and for people, individuals, um, it, it won't have any value. And that's the whole point, that it's good for, for everyone to actually do this. And uh, um, we had a person that's gone through a, a validation process in a pilot project we're running here. And she said more or less that the main point for her was that through this process, I didn't have to go through training for things I already knew. So I think I think that's a very important point. And I also, I think there's a good metaphor for this. And that comes from colleagues, other colleagues uh, from Cetaphop, for instance, that when they talk about learning, they use the metaphor of an iceberg and the former learning is just the tip of the iceberg, but everything else we learn through life, it's not visible during the surface, under the surface. So, so the whole point is making sure that that learning that's very important for all of us to make that visible and give it value, a formal value. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, before passing to the next question, I just would like to, you know, uh, let you know the geography. We have Armenia, Saudi Arabia, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Kosovo, Serbia, Tajikistan, Albania. So really covering uh, the whole planet, uh, Kiev, um, Libya, Macedonia, Kosovo, Egypt, Slovakia, Sweden. Uh, thanks a lot and keep, keep, keep those messages coming. That's really great that we know where you're watching us from. Lebanon has also just joined. That's excellent. Excellent. And then there is a, a question to what Michelle, I think, said from uh, Sona Avakimian. Then why not to incorporate the outcomes of informal education into formal education? Who wants to take it? Anna. Well, I can start to say something about the validation system in Sweden. Uh, I mean, of course, formal learning is something that you usually go through as a young person. Uh, and you go through um, the Swedish gymnasium, which is upper secondary level, and then perhaps you go on to higher education in universities, etc. But then you go out and you work and you still learn things. Uh, and perhaps when you need to change jobs or change careers or for whatever reason, 
you need to have that learning that took place after you actually left formal education also given a value. That's where validation comes in. Uh, and for instance, in Sweden, uh, it is possible to have that learning validated both for entry back into formal education and also to have what we call an exemption uh, when you are in, in universities or in, in what we're responsible for, that higher vocational education training. So you're learning in your workplace and you can have that validated to exempt parts of, of, of your formal training. Uh, and this is, I think, an important point. That's how you, that that's one way of including it. But then Sweden might be a little bit special because we know, for instance, that uh, the the average age of students going into the post secondary vet system in Sweden, the average age of them is 30 to 31 years old, which means they will most probably have both. Uh, studied and learned and worked and gained a lot of experience before they go back into education uh, to take their their level five or level six vet qualification here in Sweden. And not taking that learning into account is a waste of resources for everyone. Thanks a lot, Anna. And again, I think Swedish system is a, a system par excellence. It's one of the best functioning, actually. You might disagree, but I think we, it's really... We, we still need to do <laughs> things uh, better, I think, but we're on our way. But then coming to, uh, uh, let's say, EU neighboring countries, there is a question coming from Azerbaijan, from Fagana Ahmadova. Non-formal education isn't recognized by government, especially when you want to get a job. Only some international certificates are accepted if you have any. Non-formal education mainly helps for self-improvement. So any, any comment about that? Uh, perhaps I will comment uh, on it. Uh, Azerbaijan is uh, one of the countries uh, ETF is uh, at the moment uh, supporting in, um, in establishing uh, a validation system. And uh, some efforts have been uh, already taken uh, to recognize skills of uh, people who have been active at the labor market. So uh, of people who have been practicing certain jobs but do not have certificates and uh, uh, pilots have taken place and uh, and at the moment uh, institutions are being set up to let's say scale up this uh, these pilots and to cover more occupations um, but i think um, but i think the uh, the question was uh, about a certain type of uh, experiences and maybe also courses that perhaps young people have taken that are then not uh, being recognized by the uh, employers or uh, or maybe universities. And I think here we really need uh, a lot of work to uh, change the uh, attitude and the mindset uh, of uh, of the policymakers, practitioners in the education sector to really uh, start valuing the experiences and the learning that is taking place let's say outside of the uh, ivory towers of, of uh, formal education systems and it is uh, going to be a, a long journey uh, but uh, but we should advocate for it and we are of course striving to uh, to do it the question to everyone do you think there is a resistance from the side of formal educators formal education system to jump into non-formal the recognition of learning outcomes achieved in non-formal setting? Do you think there is this resistance? Anyone? Well, I, I can comment on it shortly, but I think Michelle should also say something with this. Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, I do believe that there is a bit of a resistance. Um, and it, it's it's uh, sometimes that you need to work with this attitude towards where learning is actually taking place. Uh, and and I think the one of the important factors that you work with that is that if you setting up a validation system, you need to make sure that your processes, et cetera, are rigorous enough so that you can be sure of, of, of the quality of that. And that's one way to ensure people in formal education that this is also possibility. But I do think this is something that many countries still are working with, and that is the attitude towards learning and learning contexts. And I, 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 I think we still have ways to go uh, when it comes to that. Um, Michelle, you worked with a lot of countries on the level of policy making. Yeah. So 
if imagine we have a policymaker looking at it at, at us right now, what would be the one time advice you would give to a policymaker who's working to develop the proper system of validation of non-formal and informal learning? So what would be your advice to a policymaker? How to make it work? I will I will bring you an answer, I promise. But first I would like to insist on the difference between non-formal and informal. It's very important in terms of uh, process, in terms of uh, uh, type of uh, learning outcomes. Non-formal learning is quite like formal learning in a certain way because there is a specific learning uh, framework for the individual we know, we know that uh, individuals, we know that they are learning something somewhere, okay? And so the question of the validation of non-formal learning is globally, generally a question of rules, uh, making the bridge between the non-formal setting and the formal setting, learning setting, etc. So it's a question of rules. We know countries where there, there are no problem for making these bridges between the two, and a lot of countries, like mine, <laughs> there are some problems to make uh, the bridge between the non-formal and the formal. The informal is another question, and thus I will answer you on the uh, regarding the policymakers. Mm -hmm. The question of informal learning, what is it? It's the fact that everybody, as Anne said, Everybody is learning every day on the job, et cetera, et cetera. And our question is how to make visible these learning outcomes and how to validate and recognize. So you see, it's two problems which are completely different between the non-formal and the informal. So I will speak, if you enable me, if you authorize. Absolutely. Informal. Okay. So, uh, when I work with uh, public authorities, authorities uh, who want uh, to develop uh, a validation process for informal learning, we know that it's uh, up to date to develop a uh, validation process everywhere, etc. Uh, so when I work with authorities, I try uh, to... Uh, to design the project, the validation project with, with them. Uh, the first question, my first question is, do you really need a validation procedure in your country? Well, why do you want a validation procedure and a validation process? What are your needs? Surely a validation process uh, is a useful tool for individuals, uh, for any of the citizens in the country. But regarding the overall panorama of the situation in the country, what are your objectives? What do you want to do with this validation process? Do you want to uh, consider the validation process as an element, as a building block of your whole policy of a uh, uh, for, uh, for your uh, vet system, vocational education training system or for your adult training system. What do you want to do with this? Do you want to work with the sectors, with the companies? Uh, what is your objective uh, regarding this? So the first question is, what do you want? Why do you want a validation process? The second question, this is the question of the opportunity. Why a validation process uh, uh, is uh, needed? The second question is regarding the compatibility. To what extent a validation process is compatible first with your uh, current or future qualification and certification system, is it compatible or not? We have mm -hmm. to 
fine to analyze this. And second, is it compatible with your adult training system? Because I'm sure that since a long time, <laughs> that a validation procedure and validation process is not the miracle uh, idea, the miracle process for bringing all the solution in one country, in one society, etc. We have to consider this process as an element of the whole system. So, Michel, just just to sum up, what are you saying? Let's say for a potential policymaker, they need to reply to questions. Yeah. What are the needs? What are Do the needs? Need? What are the needs, and uh, how it will encompass the existing qualification system in the Absolutely. country? And there is a third question. This is very important. The question. Uh, I apologize for my English. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. The question is the question of acceptability. It is fundamental. A validation process must be acceptable for all the elements of the society. Certainly, those of the citizen, those of the persons who are working in the formal system, they must accept the system. Mm -hmm. But also, all the society, in particular, in the countries where the question of the diploma, the grade, the formal certification is very important. And you know, I'm coming from a country where <laughs> we have the religion of the diploma. So it's, uh, and, uh, we know that this question of acceptability is very important. It's, and as a result of this question on acceptability, it's necessary to uh, uh, embed everybody in the society in the design process of uh, uh, teachers, for sure, policy makers, for sure, but also representative of the sectors, the companies, etc. Uh, it's absolutely necessary to have everybody in the process design of the validation process in order to be sure that it will be acceptable because there are some questions question of Michel, can I follow up on this on, on the last point of acceptability of uh, acceptance by by different okay. actors in the society? Because I think also in our chat uh, we have very different opinions. Some people say that the most difficult part is to make those certificates be recognized by the employers, and some are saying, well, actually, no employees looking at the certificates any longer; they more look for real skills. So I would like to follow this up uh, with Anna. Anna, as far as I know in Sweden, the certificate that you get in formal education will look exactly the same as the certificate that you will get going through a recognition procedure. So actually an employer cannot even know the, how you manage to get your skills and knowledge. Is that correct? Uh, yes, to some extent it is. It, 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 it depends a little bit on, on the purpose of the validation procedure and where it's, it's taking place. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's not even that it looks the same, but validation in as a formal pathway within the formal education system that I talked about earlier, this that we call exemption, uh, that will lead to the same uh, diploma or certificate or degree. So this is that that's the whole point. It will not be a different. It will not be stated on your diploma that you have had part of, of, of the learning outcomes for this diploma uh, recognized through a validation procedure. It, 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 it doesn't really matter. Uh, but in Sweden, we have, let's say, we have a sort of a dual system of validation because we both have validation that is more integrated into the formal education system, as I've talked about. But we also work with the sectors, with the companies and with the industry sectors, as Michelle said. And they are developing their own validation models for the skills that they see is needed to be employable within their sector, uh, so on. And there you might have another type of certificate uh, after going through a validation with one of those uh, models that might look um, more as a validation certificate, let's call it. But it's not a problem because it's the sectors themselves that have developed that and it's they own that certificate. So their companies and the employers, they know the value of that certificate and they, they don't really then care about whether you have earned that certificate through a validation procedure or in some kind of training. So... 
but I do think the whole point here is the fact that uh, validation, if you want it to be a system, um, I think that a system that is integrated and, and gives access to education and training and having your skills visible and valued, then you also need to make sure that it's not created in a way that it's a, 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 a B pathway, let's say. So it should be the same. It should be the same qualification. It should be the same learning outcomes, uh, et cetera, that you are sort of assessed against. And I think that's one of the most important points mm -hmm. when setting up a validation system. So I, I very much agree with Michelle. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, Maria, in EU neighboring countries, is there an issue of recognition of certificates of validation amongst the employers? Is it an issue at all in EU neighboring countries? There are a lot of uh, issues that are related to, uh, to recognition. Countries, uh, there are different practices in the countries with regard to uh, valuing certificates. Some countries value certificates very much, others don't. But I think the key question is, uh, what are these certificates worth ultimately at the labor market? And, and uh, very often, uh, if we would like the validation to be equal to uh, uh, that the certificate to be equal to the certificate that are obtained af obtained after the formal education, then I think the key question is, is the quality of the formal education good enough? And I think here the major challenge is that the uh, formal education has to undergo a big reform and the qualifications offered through formal education have to be revised, uh, uh, have to be rewritten in the language of learning outcomes to become uh, transparent. Uh, they have to be uh, um, labor market relevant, which means they have to be developed jointly with uh, with employers. And, uh, and only then we can really be thinking about equalizing these two systems. We do have examples examples of countries which uh, wanted to speed up the process of uh, and in, in the introduction of the of the validation and actually uh, chose a parallel track so not waiting for the education system to reform they uh, did organize the uh, the processes they introduced qualification new qualifications in collaboration with uh, employers with employers associations here turkey for example can be a good example with vocational qualifications authority which is a good platform for for employers the state um and also the education system uh, um, um, and 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 uh, through development of new qualifications, uh, uh, which which are uh, recognized by employers, they also set up a, a validation system uh, or system of certification. Um, so so we have really very uh, uh, many different practices, but but a very important challenge is to really change the standards in the education, uh, in the formal education system, so that then let's say, and, and have a common language, yes, between uh, the employers, the, also the, the, uh, the students, the society. And Thanks a lot, Maria. I think we will follow up on this example for, from Turkey also on another aspect of this conversation. But now I would like really to take a couple of questions from our uh, audience. There are many actually, and, and very good questions. But I will ask uh, our speakers to really reply in a Twitter style. So really a tweet, a short one. Um, question okay. coming <laughs> from uh, Siyavus Bagirov. Which of them is more preferable, formal learning or non-formal learning? Twitter style, depends on the purpose. Absolutely, yeah. Whichever gives better learning outcomes. Excellent. Uh, next one, um, Sona Avakimian. Uh, then is there any anticipation that formal education will lose its value throughout time and become not practical? There is such risk. <laughs> I, 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 would, I, would, I would say no to that, Maria. I wouldn't agree with you. I mean, we've had a... This is not, sorry, Twitter style, but I mean, we've had an adult learning system in Sweden for very many, many years, and there's so many learners going through that. It's sort of part of the formal system, but we also have learning inside companies, etc. And it it has definitely not made less people go through formal education. So I'd say okay. no. Okay. Complementary. They're complementary. 
Okay, next one. Alisar Yordanov, is the focus only for adult experience validation towards formal diplomas and certifications? So what about children and youth in crisis areas? Uh, are there, uh, do you think it's, it's a good way forward for them to go for uh, recognition of non-formal and informal uh, learning? I, I think uh, I think it's not uh, it's not the same question. It's, it's not absolutely not the same problem. Uh, when we speak, I, I speak under the control of my, my colleagues. But when we speak of validation and informal learning, not not formal informal learning, we speak of uh, of a process uh, which is intended to be used by adults. Uh, who are uh, already experienced, who have a long life sometimes uh, in terms of uh, uh, learning on the job, etc., etc. And we don't speak of the of the children. The, the question is very important, but it's not. If I uh, if I'm right, it's not our subject. I'm sorry for the. Um. Yes, thanks a lot, Michelle. Uh, just again to, to uh, reinstate the difference between uh, non-formal and informal. So uh, informal is something that you learn by doing, uh, is, is something you, you cook and you learn how to do it, right? That's the informal one. The non-formal is when you do courses in, in not formal settings, so not in education. This is non-formal. So let's, let's keep it clear the difference between informal and non-formal, right? Is that right. correct? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next one, next question, Adnan Mubarak. Massive open online courses will be a non-formal course? Is it a non-formal learning? MOOCs? You say course. Yeah. Yes. So it's like formal, non-formal course, but online. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just to clarify, I think it's important at this point to, to have these two things separated. Okay, colleagues, next question. Uh, we speak here a lot about um, validation system, but there's a system of validation and recognition of uh, skills and knowledge acquired in a non-formal setting, an informal setting. Now, the question of the century, who pays for it? Who has to pay for this validation? If a country has decided that, you know, Michelle said to us, there needs to be a decision that a country needs a system of recognition of prior learning, but who will pay for it? What are the cases worldwide? Sweden, uh, Maria mentioned Turkey. So how does it work? Who, is it a learner who will pay for it? Or is it the government that will pay for it? Who wants to take it? Should I start? Yeah. Uh, uh, again, again, it, um, it depends, of course, on the purpose of the validation procedure and how you set it up. But for, let's say, from Sweden and, and for the Nordic countries, uh, education is free of charge. So when the validation is, is happening in the formal education setting, it will also be free of charge for the individuals, more or less. Uh, it's tax funded. So um, higher education at universities in Sweden is free of charge for the individual, which means that also a validation process uh, will be free of charge for the individual. So, uh, and, and the logic behind that is, of course, that... Um, it will contribute to uh, the productivity of uh, the overall productivity of a country. So if you have more people having their, their skills, their competence recognized so that they can utilize them in the labor market, that will uh, produce tax income for the state. And then that's given back to the system, so on. So that's the setup I'd say in the Nordic countries in many other countries in the world. But then again, it depends. So. And also in Sweden, it's, it's quite clear that if you are unemployed and you um, you go through a validation process uh, through your contacts with the uh, um, unemployment benefits that you have or through the, the public employment services, that, you, that will also be free of charge for the individual. But if you are someone who's working, you're not in education, and, and I feel like maybe I want to go to the... Uh, construction sector and see what my skills is actually worth there, then perhaps there will be a fee for you as an individual uh, because it's not it's not based on a need of sort of the state uh, or society as a whole. So again, it depends a little bit on how you set it up. 
And uh, I, I can share with you a recent example of, of the benefits when it comes to financing and, and who's paying for this process. We are right uh, at this moment, we are doing a pilot project where we are creating a sort of a validation, validation pathway through the higher vocational uh, education system here in Sweden. So in parallel with people going through the training programs, let's say two, two, two year programs, as a normal learning pathway, we will now also, we're testing a validation pathway, which means that the start of that pathway is you get your, your prior learning, as we say, validated. And based on that result and what learning outcomes you can be exempt from, we create an individual study pathway with, with the remaining learning outcomes to uh, gain the diploma. And for the, the first people that we've done this for, we can see that we are reducing the cost of the education by half. So having a validation pathway in this way uh, will mean that we can probably train twice the double amount wow. of people for the same money, which is ki kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a very interesting evidence. But again, Sweden is very, uh, you know, particular case. And I would like to know the reality from EU neighboring countries. Maria, what, what is happening with paying for validation in EU neighborhood? Uh, most of the countries of EU neighborhood are still experimenting with uh, validation modalities. So um, uh, the practices vary. But I think what uh, uh, has to be mentioned is that uh, in the budgets of EU neighboring countries, there is generally very little funds to pay for validation. And it is not a cheap system. It requires uh, a good preparation of the assessors. It requires some infrastructure for, for assessments. Uh, uh, the whole system setup costs money. So in many cases, uh, there are fees envisaged. And in many instances, uh, the first regulations that are passed, they envisage that the, the participants uh, uh, will be paying. Um, but they also look at participants from disadvantaged uh, 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 groups, which actually are the groups that can benefit the most from validation. So here, uh, for example, the um, Quality Assurance Agency in Azerbaijan is discussing with the Ministry of um, um, Employment to um, Ministry of Labor to uh, use the uh, employment fund. Uh, to cover the costs of validation for unemployed. Uh, this modality is used in Turkey also. Unemployed persons do not have to uh, pay for validation. Uh, the employers quite often cover the costs. In, in Turkey, validation or certification, let's say it's mandatory for, um, uh, for those occupations which are considered hazardous. So, so there are there are really different uh, models, but what is very important is that it's not easy to attract people to validation. Um, people, in principle, do not like to be assessed, and if you ask them to get assessed and pay for it, that might become a, a, a bottleneck. Yeah, thanks a lot, Maria. We will come back to this perspective of individuals. I just wanted to ask Michelle, what what's about money in Tunisia? Who pays for validation, Michelle? <laughs> First of all, I would say that the question of paying validation is closely linked to the uh, qualification framework in the country, the qualification system. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a free market for qualification or is it a state monopoly, for instance? Mm -hmm. And this is very important because uh, the fact is that we have to consider the validation process in three times. The, the last time, I will begin by the last one, is the, the certification process, the fact that the, there is a grade, a diploma, uh, uh, full qualification or partial qualification, which is uh, awarded to the individual. The second, the intermediate, very important, is the process of uh, assessing and uh, validating the learning outcomes. And the first is the... Uh, uh, the advice process. And uh, in all countries, for example, in Tunisia, we have these three parts. And when we think to the, uh, uh, to the question, who is paying the uh, validation, we can see that depending on the part of the validation process, the pay payers 
the, the, uh, are not the same. For instance, in Tunisia, the part which is very formal, the end of the part, is the state, for sure, because the objective of the validation process is to deliver to award official diploma. Yep. For the second part, it can be very different depending on the, uh, of the context. Globally, one more time, it's the state who will pay the cost of the validation, assessment and validation process. But when we come to the first part, the advice, the advisors are paid or the advice system the, uh, is paid by the individuals sometimes, by the employers and so on. So depending on the you, you okay. see on the stage of the on the stage of the process, yes. Exactly. And yep. from one country to another, it mm -hmm. can it can be different. And also depending on the level, we can see that uh, and, and maybe Anna will uh, uh, add something. We can see that in a lot of countries, when we speak of validation in view of obtaining a, a diploma or a grade in uh, uh, voc for, uh, from vocational education and training around the uh, level to level four of the AQF, the European Qualification Framework, it's free. But when we come to the validation process in higher education, in university, it's absolutely not free. Okay. Uh, Sometimes it's very expensive for the individual who wants to obtain part of. Uh, or, uh, okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, that's clear. So it really, it really depends. We can't give a simple answer to that. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to take a couple of questions from our audience, and thanks, Emilian. I mean, yeah, the questions are really amazing. And again, I would like to ask our speakers to provide a tweet-style replies, if possible, because then we will speak about individuals' perspective on validation. So. Question uh, number one from Firia Fong. Is there a possibility for alignment between formal and informal learning so that there will be another pathway to qualification without repetition of learning? I think, Anna, you mentioned that actually in your speech. Do you want to quickly reply on that? Uh, well, yes, there are different ways of setting up that. Uh, one is the one we're trying now, where we're actually creating a validation pathway. But in Sweden, the main modality for this is that we have the rule of that you have the right to have your prior learning assessed for exemption in all parts of the formal education system. So that, that's the way you actually create this transferability between learning and in, in non-formal settings and then going into, into the formal system. Um, there are different ways to do this, but that's the way it's done in Sweden. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question com comes from uh, Efrem Santos from Indonesia. Is it true that the formal education does not always fulfill the standards of industry as compared to following a course given by a non-formal training center? Is it true that the formal education does not always fulfill the standard? I, I can start again. I think Michelle might want to say something. About this. But in as I said, in Sweden, we have a dual system. So we have about... Um, what we call a, a, a sector industry specific validation models. We have 26 of those models and they sort of encompass about 100 different vocations. And, and one of the reasons that the sectors want to work with this is because they do sometimes see that the formal education system does not deliver the competences they actually need within their sector. And this is in the in the Swedish system, this is set up because we have very, very few regulated professions. So uh, the sectors have, they, they've taken a great deal of responsibility to actually develop their own competence standards, et cetera, uh, for their own sector. And it's not, those are not always compatible with formal education. But Anna, can we say then that the validation helps to make learning more practical and more oriented towards the needs of employers? Yes. Uh, and and we do know that that when we talk about um, skill supply here in Sweden, which is a very hot topic at the moment, uh, working life actors uh, and the sectors and through the collective bargaining, the collective agreements here in Sweden, that's very much where the standards and the agreements on what competence is actually needed for you to be employable in, in sectors. So that's more, let's say, 
it's more decided on the it, with the working life actors than it is within formal education mm -hmm. and and we have we still we still have a ways to go i'd say to better link what's happening in working life and within the sectors and and then with with the formal education system. So this mm -hmm. is why we sometimes say that we have a dual system of validation in Sweden, uh, which um, is not always compatible, but that's that's homework for us to continue working with. Okay, excellent. Next one uh, from Ines Alves. An established national qualifications framework is thus a prerequisite for validation? No. 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 <laughs> why? No, 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 uh, no, no. Uh, in certain country, uh, there is a validation process and procedures well established before the establishment of the qualifications framework. Yeah. Uh, Michel, like what? Can you give a, a concrete example in what countries it, 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 this is the case? Uh, uh, France. <laughs> okay. France. We, okay. Have had, we have had a very, uh, from a very long time, uh, a validation process uh, before the uh, 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 before a qualification framework. Uh, wh when we think about the current definition of qualifications, well, I give that. Uh, however, I, I would say that. Regarding the question of qualification, this is very important. As I say, there is a question of compatibility between the validation uh, procedure and process and the qualification system, maybe the qualification framework, but certainly regarding the qualification system. The qualification must be accessible by validation. And uh, the question is, how these qualifications are designed. Are they really designed in terms of learning outcomes? As I say, in all countries where I work, if you give me a learning program, I cannot do a validation process. I need a qualification standard with learning outcomes. This is the first point. Uh, Michel, sorry for interrupt. So we need learning outcomes because we assess Absolutely. against them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't want a learning program. I, mm -hmm. I don't want the term program when I speak of validation. Okay. <laughs> so I need learning outcomes. Secondly, if I want a process, a validation process, really usable for individuals, I need qualifications organized with uh, in terms of, I can use uh, several words, units, uh, modules or whatever, but I need a specific organization of the qualifications in order to enable individuals to obtain these qualifications progressively uh, and regarding their own and real competencies uh, acquired uh, all along their life. Well, so mm -hmm. you see, uh, this is very important. Is the reason why it's difficult to speak only of the validation process without speaking of the qualification design. And I come back to the previous question. The qualification design and the assessment procedure, validation procedure, must be the result of the partnership between those who know how to do, to design a qualification, etc., and those who will use the qualification, the validation, the sectors, the companies, the economic uh, stakeholders, and so on. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Michel. So now I would like really to pass to a different perspective on this issue. We spoke a little bit about institutions and policymakers and what is needed to establish a proper system of recognition of, of, of prior learning. But from the individual perspective, is it difficult to involve individuals into the validation process? Maria, what is your experience in EU neighboring countries? Do they jump in at this opportunity? Because it is opportunity for them. Uh, it is difficult. It is difficult and not only in EU neighboring countries, in uh, many of the EU member states, it is difficult as well to attract candidates. Uh, once the systems are in place, uh, there is the question of an outreach. 
so how to find people who could benefit from a validation. And it is very important that guidance mechanisms are in place to accompany candidates through this process, which can be quite complex and involve a, a number of steps. Um, it is also very important that uh, our qualifications are modular, just in case people are not ready yet uh, for the award of full qualification. If they undergo a process, the objective of it should be empowerment. We would like them to learn about their strengths and to motivate them to participation in further learning. So it would be really important to not to send them away with a no, you failed, but to uh, show them these are the pathways that you can take. This is already what you know, and this is how you can complement it. So it really involves uh, a lot of additional elements in the system, apart from the standards, the learning outcomes, and the, let's say, stakeholder dialogue to attract uh, uh, candidates. Uh, Maria, just to follow up on what you've said, you said that qualifications have to be modular, and I think also Michelle mentioned it. So it means that qualification is like a Lego several pieces of Lego that you can build together. And if you miss one piece of this Lego, you can do it through the validation procedure, correct? Yes, and this is a big challenge for our education systems, for the organization of the typical schools, which uh, do not uh, uh, use such mechanisms, because it really implies a, a, a sort of a revolution in, in how the school life is organized. It implies that the schools would be ready to admit people throughout the year. They would be ready to, let's say, combine uh, training for more experienced and less experienced learners. So there is really a lot of uh, uh, work uh, to be done to assure that uh, uh, people come and, and and use validation. And that also includes funding, yes? In, in, in some course. countries, um, to encourage candidates, uh, uh, even uh, certain um, uh, uh, financial uh, stimuli are given to, to, to really uh, come and, uh, and, and be assessed. You know, it's it's interesting because I can understand the motivation behind of a person want, willing to validate the skills and find another job or change occupation, change change profession. But what is in motivation part of people that don't want to do the validation? Anna, maybe you you can tell us more about that. Oh, that, well, since I mainly talk to providers and people uh, with the people who wants to go through, it's difficult to say. For, I don't know anything about the people who doesn't want to, but I, I do think one of the key issues here is is what Michelle touched upon, upon earlier, the fact that you need guidance, uh, career guidance and guidance systems that also um, inform people about the possibilities of validation and, and sort of support them to take that step, take that decision. And in my experience, I think it's also important to realize that validation should be something that is you do to confirm what you've already learned, not what you don't know. So mm -hmm. I think it sh you should go into a validation procedure and feeling that this is something positive for me. But then again, we do know that people that perhaps didn't, let's say, finish upper secondary school here in, in, in Sweden uh, because they didn't like it, the school environment or whatever, it's going to be difficult because maybe those are the people that are in the biggest need to actually go through a validation procedure later in life, but it will be difficult to motivate them to go into something that again looks like it's an education or school system. So perhaps you really need to consider this when you set up your validation mechanisms. So, so first of all, it should be positive. It should not be set up for people to fail and it should perhaps be some kind of other environment that doesn't feel as school-like. And I would like to point out that I, if, if you want to know more about countries and systems where they are really, really good at this, look to Iceland. I would recommend anyone who wants to know more about that because they've been very successful with, with this specific uh, part, I'd say. Thanks, Lodana. Maria, I think you've mentioned once that uh, people don't like being assessed. Is that right? Well, I don't like to be assessed. <laughs> I'm not sure if you, Maria, like <laughs> to be assessed. But uh, well, if we look at uh, at uh, at ourselves, at which you know, when would we go? When would we do it? Uh, very often, an encouragement or a requirement or encouragement from the side of employer would really help to uh, um, um, uh, to convince us but for people who are let's say outside of the of the labor market uh, there is a huge role of uh, uh, public employment services and uh, and of guidance uh, it's also important to 
put in the validation as a, as our partner NGOs and and uh, uh, bodies which which work with uh, uh, with uh, uh, different groups of people and and know how to reach them. Um, so there are there are a lot of uh, uh, let's say mechanisms here that could improve this uh, this participation. But a very important aspect which Anna raised is how we also design the assessment and. Uh, Quite often in, in EU neighborhood, we see the tendency to actually design um, uh, assessment in a very similar way as it normally looks at school. Um, and this might be uh, uh, a little bit discouraging for these participants who did not have a positive experience with the education system. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Maria. Um, we really have three minutes left, and I would like to take another more, a question from the audience. And this one actually will go for Michelle. Uh, Michelle Majid Bayramli is asking why EU promotes vocational education training models with dual education and apprenticeship instead of French model that is more appropriate to specifically EU neighborhood countries because it is more government-led system? I Shall think I? the answer is in the question in a certain way. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, will, uh, I would say that maybe, you know, in France, the two systems are uh, working together and we, we can see that the apprenticeship is growing and growing and growing. But... Uh, uh why EU promotes vet models i think i think uh, with dual and apprenticeship i think that the that it's uh, the uh, the dual system and the apprenticeship are the archetypal uh system regarding the partnerships between the education system the, the education and training system on one side and the the uh, the companies the sectors on the other side and i, I think it's why because it's the the reason and certainly with uh, certain success stories in certain countries regarding uh the development of dual system but uh, i think that the two can't can work together so it's not about yeah imposing one model and then following it but it's finding a fit for purpose solution rather okay uh thanks a lot to everyone i think at this point actually we received another comment that opens another big big topic from ellen mccallum do we need to think of non-formal validation as also including micro credentials i don't think we will have time today to talk about it it's an indeed very interesting very topic Oh. And, and, and absolutely, we need to think about it and, and, and discuss it further, maybe on a different occasion. At this point, I would like to thank our guests because it was really interesting conversation. Michelle Aribo, thanks a million. Bye-bye. Anna Carlson, amazing. Thanks a lot for your insight from Sweden. Thank you for having me. And Maria Rosenstock from ETF. Thanks a lot, Maria, for giving us this perspective of EU neighborhood. Thank you very uh, much. As a, as, a, as a very interesting perspective. And I would like to thank all our followers for your questions and for your comments. And I would like to invite all of you to stay tuned because there is much more to come. Thank you so much and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.